Well, hello. Today is, um, that's me again. All right. I forgot that. So today is the January 28th. It's Saturday. So there's something for the weekend for you guys because it's very important. And, uh, but I will start with the date which is in the headline, so to speak, on the opening credit of my video. And, uh, the reason it is important because it was, um, on January 25th, 1763, where by the order of Catherine the Great, the Russian general staff has been formed. Actually, gen Russian general staff as the uh, basically qu quartermasters, uh, so to speak, uh, uh, and quartermasters uh, was known, uh, was already in its uh, uh, embryonic form uh, around the times of the Peter the Great, but it was specifically Catherine, Catherine the Great who created the Russian general staff, which obviously uh, five, uh, three days ago celebrated its 260th anniversary of the creation and yeah it's older than the United States as the state and yeah it's just the way Russian military history goes and uh, it is the main organ of the combat control of all armed forces of Russian Federation. And believe me, this is an organization which is in terms of demand uh, to the personnel, officers, especially operators which uh, serve there is in extremely high. I mean, extraordinarily high. It's probably high in many respects than even people who go into the serious intel services. So uh, this is just the date which is significant. and. I wanted to point this out that we should not uh, uh, forget about that uh, if you look at the in terms of the war experience and in terms of the military successes there are no parallels to Russian general staff especially when you look at uh, the organization so to speak the organ of the combat control which although has its own failures and its own defeats as anybody does but the record of the victories sometimes outstanding victories is absolutely overwhelming there is nothing comparable in the world out there to this and that is very important but I would like to uh, not to start to continue so to speak with another thing which is of course of extreme import here because we're going to be talking about the complete incompetence utter incompetence in terms of, of the operational strategic planning which you could see now all around Washington and especially in NATO countries in Europe and that uh, w will be kind of the point of my talk today to you but we will start with this thing which is absolutely crucial in fact is it's strategic and when he was saying this uh, I was applauding and laughing because I was saying this for decades before and when you have the guy like this who of course is Mr. Putin and the president of Russian Federation and one of the most brilliant men probably of the century this is what he says it was on the 7th July of 2022 and when he was talking um, basically on the uh, uh, forum what is called the leaders of Russia he stated it literally like this Putin considers very moot point of p p political science as science. And he says, uh, basically straight, that it's not really science. And when he uh, asked the question uh, if there is even such science as politology or political science, when he uh, heard the uh, uh, affirmative uh, answer from the crowd, or he la with laughter he stated that's a moot point, and he stated correctly that um, political science has to, you know, any any science has the some kind of sphere of the study and research. Uh, political science doesn't exist as such. It doesn't have any uh, uh, doesn't have any scientific method of the research, and it doesn't have the subject of the research. And I was, my gosh, I was applauding this. I was so feeling so giddy. I was feeling so, uh, uh, I was overjoyed, honestly, because this is the uh, point which I'm talking about for many, many years. I read about it for many, many years that basically. Uh, the subject which we know as the political science is nothing but the random collection of the uh, facts of the political history and as any kind of the subject which 
is absolutely newbie, newcomer, so to speak. It was created for people who cannot solve basic uh, equations and do not understand physics to get into it and get their some kind of degree and credentials to start talking about things they have no clue about because any course on the political science does not teach fundamental issues related to the actual operation of the society other than on the political level in terms of the they love to call it policy. There are no policies, really. Uh, in terms of their basically electoral uh, politics, primarily in the Western world, and sadly, that's those people, they basically disseminated themselves, they penetrated all kinds of their uh, uh, organizations, academic organizations, where they continue to deliver this BS. Let me explain. Let me demonstrate to you what political science looks like. Let's talk a little bit of the, so to speak, most important, uh, you know, milestones in the political science, which I, is not a science, which is basically fraud. But let me uh, take a look how the, how good, the, good being, obviously, I'm being facetious, and I mean absolutely opposite to that, uh, uh, how good, quote unquote, those people are in predicting or studying anything. We will start, of course, with this. Oh my gosh, you, of course, remember all that. Would start. It's uh, they called it the most outstanding work. It's called the end of history and the last man. It is. Uh, uh, this is uh, hundreds upon hundreds of pages of their absolutely ignorant speculation with the throwing or into the mix all kinds of the random facts of human history, and Mr. Fukuyama now he is a meme basically for uh, ignorance. Then of course we can go further. We can take a look at this guy, who is also political science. They're all political scientists. Mr. Zbigniew Wyszyzinski, the grand chessboard. Well, guess what? Nothing panned out as he predicted. <laughs> well, because, of course, he never understood the subject, including the subject of the geopolitics. He was a whiteboard theoretician and fanatical Russophobe. And this is the thing, you know, he wanted to destroy Russia. Well, guess what? He would be really, well, he probably is rotating his grave, seeing how his uh, Western civilization is killing itself. Then, of course, we can go even further. And, of course, this is another great political scientist and the founder of the Foreign Policy magazine, which is now tabloid and absolutely fanatical neocon rag. But, yeah. Did the clash of civilizations happen? Yes, it happened. It happens between the most of the world and the combined West. And of course, the, the way he described the clash of civilizations never materialized. Albeit, I have to admit, there are some pages of brilliance in this uh, particular case. Then, of course, we go to Mr. John Merschheimer, who is really not doing great, uh, really, a service to his alma mater, which is United States Military Academy at the West Point, when he... Uh, published this latest tedious, almost nauseating treatise, by the way, he quotes the same Fukuyama, and <clears throat> you look at this and like, my gosh, did they ever produce anything of value? Well, of course, we can go even further, and the guy also is the uh, uh, political scientist, and guess what it is? It is, of course, Mr. Henry Kissinger, who writes about diplomacy. I don't really know how else to uh, assess this, because basically what he was producing in the last um, few years, it's, it's a delirium. It's a delirium of a man who is leaving the world stage, who still thinks that he's great, he never was, and who thinks that he's an exemplary diplomat. And when you look at this and you think that if, if this is the best American diplomacy ever produced, that I'm sorry, but we know the result. It's steady development. It's all evolution of this fake uh, uh, science, so to speak, which among, for example, courses which you can take look at, the, at Harvard, just to give you an example, you can look at the courses and look look what they teach. This is one of the advanced courses identifying pros and cons. My God, they study in this uh, uh, course how to do cost-benefit analysis. Well, obviously, the problem here, with as all, always the case with the political scientists, they do not have a clue what they are writing about because they don't understand 
physical world they don't understand physical processes involved in this world and of course they do not understand warfare in fact is they are totally ignorant of it they cannot pro uh, process the data which goes from those uh, incredible i mean enormous uh, sacrifices and victims uh, humanity basically made on the altar of the military science and they that's why they begin to write all kind of pardon my french bullshit and that is why when you read all those uh, uh, political science uh, treatises and how they describe the history, how they try to project or extrapolate linearly most of the time, the history onto something, they ignore all of them. And you saw yourself, most, mostly primarily American political scientists. There are some Western political scientists. And of course, I do not treat Russian political scientists seriously. Most of them are just basically fraudsters and shysters who <laughs> make living from producing all kinds of the useless uh, projections but they don't know what war is they don't understand it if you look at all those writings of those people for the last 30 years everything they ignore there they ignore this s funny little period of time from 1914 through <clears throat> 1945 where humanity primarily well not primarily but mostly let's put it this way in europe and around the world annihilated more than 75 million people as the uh, act of the warfare and so you have those people who come out and begin to write about some democracy, Magna Carta, about some political process, about this and that, which is absolutely irrelevant when it's projected against the fundamental background of human <clears throat> main quality, making war, conflict. But if they could understand the, uh, what it means to put the dash over T in the naval warfare of the uh, 19th century. Today, they are absolutely unqualified. They don't have any background in mathematics, physics, theory of operations, what have you, in trying to even understand what modern warfare is, how it relates in terms of the operational art strategy, how it forms politics, and how the policies form this warfare. They don't understand how it happens and yet we have these people who basically ignore fundamental property of human character it's our inst uh, instinct of pugnacity or our pugnacious behavior and the <clears throat> humanity was at warfare from the, from the dawn of civilization yet those people go into all kinds of the you know sideways trying to explain things when you have to take a look and that uh, basically the whole geopolitics is reduced to one simple things power defines the balance of power period nothing more after that of course you need to know what the nature of the power is especially its main ingredient military power but that's where we have the situation that we have all those you know uh bestsellers new york Times bestsellers about some kind of crap with from the guys who wouldn't be able to command freaking score can you imagine francis fukuyama was being a brzezinski commanding their platoon I can't, but that these are the people who talk about this. They are they will not understand the difference between T72B and T72B3. For example, I'm talking about tanks, let alone T90, and of course I'm not going into the evil naval warfare. And those people are still writing this crap without even understanding how the command, National Command Authority operates on the base, for example, for the uh, uh, control of the nuclear weapons. Yeah, those people write this non-stop. They wrote and they continue to write all this bullshit and they continue to ignore, for example, the results of the World War II. They continue to ignore the statistics of it, despite the fact that they give them some basic statistics course in the uh, political science. And why do I say so? Well, the reason I say so and the reason I... <clears throat> really try to concentrate on this is because let me sh show you some results of the political scientists and people who represent this field of study so to speak of fake uh, science and uh, together with the basically catastrophic uh, 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 western humanities education uh, let me r remind you this remember this oh yeah it was uh, in 2019 the Washington Post a secret history of the war in Afghanistan it was December 9, 2019, when they uh, basically published the 
this incredible tro treasure trove of the documents which demonstrated a complete ignorance and utter incompetence of military political leadership of the United States because they couldn't find uh, basically their own ass in a brightly uh, lit room with their bold hands when it came to the issue of the war in Afghanistan. Look what they wrote then. Year after year, U.S. officials failed to tell the public the truth about the war in Afghanistan. The strategy became self-validating. Immediately, pay attention to this. Guess how it became self-validating? It became self-validating through the methods and uh, uh, data analysis produced by political scientists, including those political scientists who actually go and get their degrees while having their uh, stars on their epaulets. I'm talking about professional military. They play and with the data and they try to feed it into the whatever required model they have, the current thing. Look at this. The lessons learned interviews, con uh, the lessons learned interviews contradict years of public statements by presidents, generals, and diplomats. The interviews make clear that officials issued rosy pronouncement they knew to be false and hid unmistakable evidence the war had become unwinnable. Several of those <laughs> interviews described explicit efforts by the U.S. government to deliberately mislead the public and the culture of willful ignorance where bad news and critique were unwelcome. Well, guess what? Take a look at all political science uh, uh, field in the United States and all these things, thank them. This is the description of it. Those people are basically morons. And that people, the other people, for example, from Pentagon, who would have enough honor and integrity to say otherwise, well, they will be thrown out because this is the field which they occupy and this is the sinecure. You live of that. The truth, the science doesn't matter because if we reduce the political science field and everything related to it, it can be summarized in the single phrase. They are data handlers to fit any kind of narrative. Now look at this. We'll continue with the WAPO. And look at this. That's what they say. We were devoid of a fundamental understanding of Afghanistan. We didn't know what we were doing. What it reminds you of, guys? Oh, let me tell you. Of course it reminds you of uh, 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 to, uh, today's situation with Ukraine and the way United States is trying to handle this whole situation. And of course fails, left and right. It lies non-stop. I mean, uh, if you look attentively what they are writing, it's absolute, I mean, delirium. It's delirium from the point of view of people who are the scholars of the policies, especially defense policies. And of course it is delirium from the purely military point of view. Because obviously those guys won't be able to freaking move my lawn on the Saturday uh, evening in the summer. Yet they go out and start speaking. What is the crucial organization which represents that? Well, let me tell you, it's RAND. RAND is the pinnacle of the development of the bullshit development in the United States. It is associated with the Pentagon and it is staffed to the hilt with PhDs in political science and most people in uh, RAND, apart from few generals and colonels here and there, they never saw any kind of military activity in their life. Yet they write and suggest all this crap. Well, guess what? Uh, they're just uh, the data or well, information I described to you from the Washington Post about Afghanistan and utter failure, let alone the humiliation which the United States experienced while trying to run away from uh, Afghanistan and leaving eight and a half billion worth of equipment. Those were all things projected and written about by those political scientists from RAM. Well, guess what? Now Rand comes up with yet another bullcrap and they uh, produced it uh, just a um, couple of days ago. And uh, this is the article by uh, about avoiding a long war. The article is filled with f uh, false information, mi misinformation, lies and but Suddenly somebody in Rand, oh my gosh, and look at the name, Samuel Charap and Miranda Pribe, they write about avoiding a long war. Huh, why do they, uh, why they are afraid about this long war? Uh, well, we can take a look at um, 
basically what they trying uh, to say uh, in this uh, respect because uh, they really are not ready they really not ready the west is not ready they do not understand how the long wars are fought and what real war is because the only thing the united states knows is to get into the third world uh, country uh, drop as many bombs and smart munitions as possible and then think then declare the victory then get stuck on it get humiliated get out and say that we still want it and we took a look at uh, vietnam and things of this nature and obviously nobody in Iran. i read rand papers my gosh this is not serious People sometimes scratch your head that, that those people don't even operate with proper data. And as I already uh, described in the last video and video before that, they operate on the data provided by Kiev regime, which is complete lies. Basically, it's a bullshit. It's garbage in, garbage out. But the problem, of course, here uh, is in the classic Geigo uh, issue is that, well, it describes the situation when the at least algorithm should be correct. Well, the problem is rants and other political scientists and other policy and decision makers in the United States operate on the algorithm which is also garbage. So you get the garbage in into the garbage algorithm and guess what you get? You get the double garbage, if you wish, uh, on the out as the outcome. And um, when you look at this baloney which those people uh, write from Rand and they now, of course, they're scared. They do this pro and con analysis, which is the basically, I don't know, the high school level type thing obviously they write about things they have no clue about they do not understand warfare they do not understand real economy but let's take a look at their um let's take a look at their uh, bi biographies if you look attentively at this thing you can see yourself that samuel charap is a senior political scientist in rand corporation miranda Preby is director of the center for analysis of u.s grant strategy and senior political scientist at the rand corporation okay let's take a look further uh let's take a look who samuel charap is in kind of detail the guy he has phd in political science university of oxford master of, uh, of philosophy in russian and east european studies uh fraudulent uh, field of study in the west university of oxford nba in political science and russian um, uh, in russian and amherst uh, uh and amherst college the guy learned russian he was lecturing at some point of time in 2000s uh, uh <coughs> in Russian Moscow uh, Institute of the International Relations at the times when Russians were still kind of interested what uh, those guys from the United States had to say. Obviously, now it's basically nobody will allow this guy near uh, anywhere in Russia. And the only uh, scientific, so to speak, credential he has is the fact that he might have rubbed their uh, shoulders with some people who were close to the political top and political bombond in Moscow. And that's about the extent of their expertise in Russia. Uh, again, I speak uh, English uh, fairly well, but I don't read Chaucer, you know, but it took me 30 years to figure out the United States, its culture, living here, being a U.S. citizen and knowing the, you know, terms and uh, those idiosyncrasies of the American politics and ideology and culture. Some of which I love dearly, others I despise but as anybody in, in the United States. So you have this guy who, who basically is not educated into anything and they make those, you know, predictions and try to explain that, yeah, we have to avoid the long war. Why you have to avoid the long war? Well, because not because you have to avoid the long war, but because you were ignorant, as were people in Pentagon who were planning to, after declaring the first sanctions on Russia, to see Russia collapse. The guys obviously had no clue what they were dealing with. And again, uh, it's easy to check because I love, you know, internet. It holds all those records, you know. You can look it up, what I was writing seven, eight, nine years ago. And I was saying, guys, you, didn't, you do not know what you're doing. You got yourself into the pickle big time and you're going to lose. So, and to demonstrate to you how incompetent and not understanding what uh, is going on they are well let's talk a little bit just a little bit about war economy now when we have this whole hustle and whole hysteria about delivering some kind of what 88 81 who cares number of tanks with those idiots believing that the ukraine can uh, do their counter offensive 
Um, I'll give you the number, which please don't be shocked. And the number is that by different estimates, Russia can produce in one year up to 800 main battle tanks. And we're talking about new battle tanks, T-72B3s and T-90Ms. But let me show you, not to be uh, kind of, you know, just making those statements into the uh, air. We'll take a look at the uh, Russian magazine National Defense of 2014. Uh, after 2014, evidently this data, correctly so, actually was kind of obfuscated for a reason. But let's take a look at the new MBTs which have been produced by Russia at the top, United States and Germany. Let's take a look. As you can see yourself, in 2007, Russia produced 148 tanks. And we're talking about new versions of tanks. Then you can see yourself a little bit of the deep in 2008, after the crisis, you know, all things like this. But look at this. If you take a look at how, the, the dynamics of the tanks, of the tanks production, you can see yourself so that starting from 2013, Russia was producing until 2014, roughly 100 tanks a year. Well, guess what? After 2014, this number started to grow dramatically. You know why, obviously. Crimea happened. Then you can see yourself that 2011 was the last year when the United States produced 195 tanks, and we don't even know if these were brand new tanks. And as a result, you can see yourself that aggregate number of tanks produced by Russia through 2007 through 2014 was uh, 1291. 457, almost three times less by the United States, which already, starting from 2012, stopped any tank production, and by now I'm pretty sure lost all engineering know-how and industrial base to do so. Then, of course, we look at the Germany, and Germany is kind of like, yeah, not even serious here. 348 tanks, and this is, was a 2014. As I already stated, by then things started to grow dramatically. And uh, as the result of this, as a result of the start of the, this de facto hybrid war of combined West on Russia, Russia producing, yeah, we have this data today that, yeah, up to 800 tanks a year. Compare this to the um, number of tanks. Uh, United States doesn't produce, so Russia will have about, what, 800 times more tanks producing a year, certainly more than Germany and more than all, all NATO combined. And that is why people do not understand that Russia will outproduce combined West if it comes down to all important uh, weapon systems. You heard Mr. Putin a week ago, or two weeks ago, he stated, and I quote, the number of the air defense missiles Russia produces is uh, basically more than uh, uh, the whole West combined. And of course, in terms of cruise missiles, Russia produces it's three times more than uh, West combined. Just look up the uh, look up Putin's quote on that matter. So yeah, that's why they're afraid now and try to avoid a long war because obviously they never plan for that. Why they did never plan for that? Because they have degrees in political science. That means they don't study the subject. They do not understand what real war economy is, what Russia is. They do not understand <clears throat> the influence of the Soviet period on Russia. Well, and you begin to look at it, they don't understand shit, basically. And you have these guys from RAND who write all those pathetic uh, pseudo-academic uh, papers which are designed to only support Pentagon in whatever, the most of them, the delirious program developments and basically they're, you know, just laundromat to make money. It's all about making m money for military industrial complex. And then you look at this and it's like, my gosh, obviously they cannot sustain the long war. Russia can. And that's when you begin to understand the fundamental strategy behind decision by the general staff and how general staff and, of course, political leadership of Russia, which has many intelligence and military people already in there, they got together and they figured that out. And that's why Russia wants a long war. That's why Russia does economy of force. And that is why Russia already annihilated the third iteration of the what is called armed forces of Ukraine with their NATO volunteers, so to speak. And when you begin to look at this, you have to see the pattern, non-stop pattern of the 
utter academic failure, which of course then projects itself into the policy failure and it projects itself onto the military failure. And of course, that is why Russians say and, you know, send in, you know, the clones, send in the tanks. We'll deal with this. Now, Ukraine obviously wants the, some uh, jet fighters, but of course already they got the answer that, yeah, we will give you jet fighters. UK said it. Only after Russia leaves the uh, territories which it really occupies, quote unquote, it means never. So, and we have the situation, and when you begin to look at this basically whole spectrum, the field of those political scientists, you have to come to the conclusion this Mr. Putin is absolutely correct. And instead of the going there and studying some kind of the hodgepodge collection of the random uh, uh, facts, political, historical, and military facts, very many of them absolutely falsified or not true just from the get-go, they should have applied for the uh, Russian Academy of the General Staff. Not that they will pass there, you have to know really well mathematics and physics, because after all, modern military has nothing in common, even with the militaries of 1914 and 1918. And anybody who apply lessons to that, especially in terms of the industrial development of the society and military economy, uh, they are simply unqualified. And this is the basically the feature, not a bug of the bug of modern uh, political military elites in the West. And this was my talk, so short talk to you today about those funny things with the numbers. So guys, have a nice weekend, you know, and as always, those who can support me, please support me on the Patreon or buy me a <clears throat> Jack coffee and uh, Subscribe to my channel and I will be talking to you later. Bye-bye.